Welcome to the 4D Talks, a podcast about the fourth dimension of architecture, aka all the things that architects should consider in their designs, but often don't. In each episode, my guests and I discuss how this fourth dimension can influence our experience in the built environment and how we could use it to make better architecture that serves people and improves the life. Architects, students and architecture enthusiasts, join the brainstorm and let's discover the fourth dimension together. What if we started considering architecture design as creating memorable experiences for people? Looking at interiors as immersive and interactive places. Finally, what if we saw public spaces as art installations that boost the sense of belonging? Let's talk today about art as the fourth dimension of architecture. And there is no better person to discuss this topic with than Grant Dudson, experiential artist and creative director at Chorus Agency in London. Grant links the fields of art and architecture, designing brand experiences, events, as well as three-dimensional and immersive art installations. Thank you, Grant, for joining me today. It's an absolute pleasure. Glad to be here. Thank you. In your projects, you very often try to achieve this quality of immersivity, sort of like being interactive. And how does that influence the user experience? I think the experience is need to be fully immersive because everybody wants to be transported to a a new place right it has a whole kind of dimensional aspect to what it gives you in terms of feeling uh, in terms of connection and if you go into a space that isn't fully immersive there's obviously always going to be a distraction so if you're saying right as a brand or if it's an architecture for example this is the space i'm presenting to the audience you want to really fully bring them into your narrative. If, for example, there's a wall on the right, or if there's a doorway that hasn't been considered, or there's lots of noise you know, behind them, they're never ever really going to be fully immersed or fully connected to the experience you're trying to bestow upon them. The narrative is so crucial. It's that sense of setting the scene so that people feel as though they've been transported somewhere else where they're fully engaged and fully part of that world and and it's so crucial and i know that a lot of brands don't quite get that right but it's something i speak a lot about because i want brands to start thinking about this um as a priority when it comes to design so basically um we're talking here about sort of a mix of psychological and physical relation right so i think with the three-dimensional space you also make people perceive it in a specific way and then relate to it. I always try to sort of find parallels in the architectural field or urban design field as well. And I think, um, well, if we used arts a bit more into creating um, all kinds of placemaking strategies, right? Ur- installations, urban installations, um, this is also the way to sort of find a way for people to identify with the space um, much more. Definitely. And something that you also mentioned here was uh, the sound. Actually, that's, uh, I would go a step further because besides all the other things that you're doing, being an artist, a, an actor as well, um, you're also a singer. And I am very curious how, for you, sound also, how much of a role does sound play in creating either branding experiences, but also in general user experience for people um, within those installations? Um, sound is crucial. I mean, again, it's about subverting distraction. That's the most important thing. So if you if you take an experience and you say, right, this needs to be fully immersive, we need to fully engage our audience, you can't do that unless you address all the senses. And obviously visual is one of those, but sound is another crucial one. You have the olfactory, so the notion of scent and fragrance that also comes into play. So if you really want to connect properly, if you really want to transport somewhere, uh, someone to somewhere, within the parameters of your storytelling, then you need to address all of those different sensorial attributes to making that experience holistically sound uh, and complete. I think it's really important to nail your sound design as much as it is any other part, including obviously um, visual. Yeah, you did mention a smell here as well. Um, For people who listened to my first episode about senses, this is actually one of the senses that I am, it's one of the most important ones, the one that um, sort of played the biggest role in creating memories. But is it only about 
because I, I can imagine that you know a lot of brands have their the signature fragrance. Mm. Do you think it's just about that, or is it about like maybe using the smell of water or forest or or wood? I think it depends on the context of of the narrative that you're trying to sell into your audience, right? If you're taking them somewhere that is very much environmental and you're trying to recreate a world. So for example, for Talisker, I was recreating what it might be like to step through the kelp forest because that was part of their initiative to rewild the oceans. And so in that sense, you needed to get that notion of being in the sea. So we had all of the kind of sea salt spray that would kind of make people feel as though they were actually walking through this kelp forest. The other side of that obviously is to walk through a kelp forest, you're going to get very wet. So we needed to kind of create that sense of of doing so using technology like projection mapping and and kind of lots of transparent voil strips to to be indicative of what it might be like to step through that kelp forest and try and get that illusion as close to what it might be like as possible without obviously bringing water into it and and giving people a sense of what the sea smells like and maybe kelp and all of that that really does add a hell of a lot of value in transporting people to that world so in that case environmental elements like the seaweed like the the sea are, are crucial if we're talking brand signature perfumes then of course they can leverage that depending on the experience that they're putting on and to be honest with you every time i go on holiday i'll buy a new fragrance because i kind of chapterize that holiday by then having a fragrance that reminds me of it right so i have maybe about 20 or 30 different fragrances which is i know is way too much getting out of control but every time i pick up a certain aquity palmer takes me back to you know um the amalfi coast right because that's the first time i smelt it and that's and i i love that smell and every time i'm feeling a little down especially even in the middle of winter if i spray that on me i transport back to the amalfi coast in the middle of july you know and it's and it's this level of 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 power that you can provide your audience if you really understand you know how to use fragrance in a complementary way to enhance that overall brand experience so it's crucial yeah i'm wondering to what extent architects could do that in spaces we design i mean i mean think about architecture in the sense that when you look at a building generally it's all about visual right you look at it and you go wow that's amazing it's captivating i want to go inside i want to explore more but what if the bricks had a smell? What if the architecture had a smell? What if Zaha Hadid's architecture had this fingerprint, which was very much a DNA-based fragrance that always made you think of her work? And it's almost like you can smell it around the corner and you know that there's a building there by Zaha Hadid, right? And it's the same with hotels. If you walk into a lot of like, if you go into Charlotte Street, um, hotel all of that's been designed by kit kemp they have i think it's rick rack which is the fragrance that you smell when you walk in that also expands into the soap that you wash your hands with and it smells so good and every time you walk into that atrium and that restaurant and all of that like you're hit with this smell and, and it's become their signature smell so why can't architects also kind of think about if they're designing this building and they want a bit of a an identity or a fingerprint that really much very much denotes you know the uh usp of of, of their design and what they create then this should definitely be factored into that 100 percent. so that's the lesson number one for architects i agree imagine no bricks when it rains in england which it does a lot right and they give off a smell when it rains so when they get wet they give off a smell of summer for example Right. And you know that when you walk past this building, you will always get this sense of summer, irrespective of what season it might be. It's just that kind of thing. There's so much technology now and so many incredible scientists out there exploring new ways of coming up with, you know, different materials and and um, and how they interact with different weather conditions. These are the types of things all architects should be diving into in order to figure out new applications or, or new ways of design. I completely agree with you. And sometimes it's not even about technology, right? It's sometimes it's just about combining nature, for instance, or like using specific types of plants. It does not necessarily have to be artificial, right? It can actually be also completely natural. For instance, 
how the material smell when wet or when when dry. Um, something that's also quite interesting, and here I see a little bit of movement in architecture in that sense, and that's um, the meditative aspect of art and meditative aspect of architecture. Mm, I think big offices already start thinking about it a bit more with recharge rooms or, or they are very immersive experiences. It's either about light or about fluffiness of what surrounds you. They're often small nooks. And it's something that you've actually also played with a little bit, right? Yeah, I well, I love, I love all of that. I think that far too often, and I talk a lot about this, and I'm kind of writing a book at the moment called Grow Down. And the whole notion is that there are principles, I think, that we're even born with as children that we forget about as we get older. And when we get to teenage years, we're always told to grow up, grow up. And then suddenly we find ourselves in adulthood and then we just go, wow, what kind of deal is this? You know, we can't have fun anymore. We have to wear a suit and tie. It all becomes really serious and lots of responsibility. And then everyone gets stressed. And it's like, well, why don't we take a page out of our book when we were young when we were free and i know that we've been looked after by our parents uh, you know if we're lucky uh, we didn't have to worry too much about anything other than you know doing our homework um, and getting decent grades but there was always that sense of play and i think that that we lose that sense of play as we get older and i think that there's a real opportunity to bring that back in so many different ways so you talk about nooks and crannies and kind of going on a little bit of a an exploration adventure. I think that's so crucial to the way we need to design our lives moving forward. And we need to go back to what it was like when we built a den. You know, you know, we created a den with like some chairs and we put it was as simple as just putting a sheet over the top of some chairs and suddenly you completely transform that space. And then you crawl underneath and you kind of sat there with a little lamp that maybe you know is turned on the other side of the sheet but it's that atmosphere that it creates it's magical it's whimsical it's a sense of wonderland and we did that all the time when we were young and when we get older we don't do any of that right we we just try and hit deadlines we go out we're so exhausted that we just need to get blindly drunk in order to kind of you know escape the the difficulties and the responsibilities of life you know life gets hard. So within the experiential sector, it's our job. Within the architecture sector, it's our job to create those worlds that people can step into and get lost a little bit. The reason we travel all the way to the other side of the planet to go to see an island that no one discovered, you know, um, until maybe about 50 years ago is because we want a whole change of sensory stimuli. We want a change of environment. We want to get lost because we want to not necessarily escape. And I don't see it as a, as a negative thing. And escapism is a good thing. The sense of escapism is the sense of taking a step into another world, another place that teaches you not only about the environment that you're in because it's brand new, but new experiences and new environments teach us a lot about ourselves as well because we're interacting with something like that for the first time. And every time you have that new experience, you get to see a different part of who you are. And I think that's really important for me as an experienced designer and an experiential artist to create these worlds that really do challenge your notion of, of play and also challenge your notion of adulthood and what it means to be an adult. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to reinvent that narrative. That's very, very true and very interesting. You know, sometimes we do fly to another continent just to swing on a in a hammock, right? And right. that's why can't we have those in every waiting room in a hospital, for instance? Exactly. Especially because, again, there is always a, a part of it that could be very playful. And either it's, uh, you know, a large area in a hotel, in an office space, in a public building, any public building, really. And I think the furthest we go is designing modular furniture that you can just move around. But you can, there is so much more potential to go way further with it, with hanging and swinging. And if you think about the position in which you work, you can also be laying down. Maybe you should be hanging upside down. I don't know. Recently, we actually uh, also designed a, a sauna at the roof terrace, which I think has this uh, element of, of playfulness in it as Definitely. well. No, I, I think everything that you just said is 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 absolutely where everything needs to go. If you think about, you know, since COVID, 
we're in a position where we don't need to go to the office anymore, right? But it's not without want of, you know, maybe kind of thinking that it's the right thing to do. It's kind of, well, I prefer being at home. I prefer being in, you know, the rooms that I've designed as opposed to somebody else. But maybe the design of these offices are just not quite up to scratch enough for them to become destinations. Whereas if they were destinations where you went, oh, my God, my office is like an adult playground. I'd be in the office a lot more because I go, I want to go and hang out in. And I'm not going to say ball pool because I feel like everyone's like, everyone's done a ball pool and it's just a little bit trite now, you know. Um, but nevertheless, like you, you, there's always ways to kind of make ball pools cool or, or, or there's there's ways to do things that are, if you look at architecture, for example, which is a really amazing uh, collective of, of artists stroke architects and the stuff that they did, they did an epic ball pool that was, Literally, everything was white uh, and it was amazing. And it's like, well, why couldn't you do a meeting in there? Why couldn't you climb, you know, in, why couldn't you go under your desk? Why isn't the desk accommodating like a space where you could just sit cross-legged with a bunch of friends, you know, and do a brainstorm? Like, we want to go to environments that stimulate that sense of play. And once that happens... You know, the dopamine, dopamine levels and serotonin levels, all these these things that happen to your brain get you in a state of rich, you know, kind of uh, cognitive exploration. And then once you're in that state, then you can come up with the best ideas possible. You know, bring in some really cool music or whatever it is. Like, I think that we're in a world where it's become way too rigid. And I think rigidity has a massive impact on the way we actually address our ability to be creative. I think creativity comes from joy. It, it comes from uh, a place of excitement. And I think environments and spatial design allows all of those elements of who we are to, to be enhanced, to, to be maximized. And I think that's your job and my job, architects, experiential designers, all of that is very much key to making people feel more free and more open as people. And therefore, I think they'll become more productive um, leaders and, and creatives as a result. That sounds like a great conclusion, but we're not done yet. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you then, what do you think about those mixed reality experiences? This is a huge trend these days. Mm. So we're talking about virtual reality. We're talking about augmented reality. Do you think you can create sort of the same level of engagement with these kinds of tools or or is this not possible? Um, you're never going to get better than reality, right? We don't even know what we're living in. You know, this might be the holy grail of virtual reality. We just don't know. You know, is, is this the matrix? Like we just, we don't know. But the one thing is, is that, yes, you know, I bought an Oculus Quest about three years ago to trial it and I loved it. You know, and I could see the potential of it. You know, if you want to go into a space and just meditate, if you want to go flying somewhere in a galaxy that doesn't exist, you know, if you want to ride a unicorn for five minutes before you go into a meeting, you can do all of that, right, with virtual reality. And I think augmented reality is just going to take it to another level because it is the combination, the integration of reality and virtual reality. And I think that gets really interesting because, you know, and it can play to everyone's ego. I mean, imagine being able to go into a room and all the paintings on the wall are not paintings. They are pictures from your Instagram account because that's what you've programmed in your glasses. So everyone's going to feel like a celebrity wherever they go. There's a real opportunity to take, you know, escapism to a completely new level with the advancements of virtual reality and also you know, haptic technology to kind of give you that sense of physicality with the virtual experiences that you have. And then augmented reality is just going to be on a on another level. We won't need our phones anymore. Everything will be through this. Well, this, this is sort of slowly happening. I saw some, I think it was BMW, having this ad on um, driving a car and seeing everything augmented. Um, and on one hand, I think it's fascinating where it can go and also the idea of making it customized so it's really personalized for you, right? If you have a bad day, you're going to see puppies running around you. It's kind of cool 
I see that, but at the same time, I'm a little bit worried that architects will use it as an excuse to design even more boring spaces because then, you know, then let's just design green rooms with green walls and then everyone can just imagine whatever they want. And so I kind of hope that we will still stay with tangible elements that you can also interact with using your whole body, not just your eyes. I 100% agree. Like, like in real life experiences will never go away. You know, they will only evolve with the evolution of virtual reality and augmented reality. Like we're not replacing one thing for another here. This is all going to be symbiotic. And if you look at experiences now, everyone's like, experiences are done. After COVID, they were like, we're done. Experiences, retail's dead. Like, well, no, it's not. Because in real life, experiences are so crucial. They always will be. What you're having with augmented reality is that you're doing exactly that. You're augmenting the reality that you're already in. And you're making, you're making it better to a degree. There's still that physicality. You're still interacting with everything. But then I think with everything like virtual reality and augmented reality, we get to a stage where we've been doing so much of it. Like Gen Z's now are all into the 80s. You know, they love all of the analog stuff, right? They're like, oh, there's a cassette player. This is cool, right? We always, as human beings, want something that we've never had before. And I feel like the more kind of technology uh, driven we become, the more appreciation we'll actually end up having for nature for being in you know a beautiful uh like seaside resort right or you know laying next to a gorgeous uh river or stream that runs down from the top of the mountains in the peak district or wherever you are and taking in the smells and listening to the actual authentic you know kind of world that has been built around us like we talk about design like look at the world we're living on this is a ball that just spins around at the perfect momentum in space you have a moon that pulls that like you just you we, we take all this for granted but everything that we're part of is this divine design it doesn't get better it will never get better all we can do is just entertain ourselves because that's also something that we enjoy doing but uh, as human beings we always need to, to stay engaged and i feel like virtual reality augmented reality and in real life experiences will always work symbiotically, definitely. So I don't think when you're saying, you know, architects will take the the very kind of low hanging fruit approach to, you know, creating a green room. I think that'll happen as well, but I also think there'll be another room which is all based on biophilic design or vertical farms or whatever it is, where nature is brought into that world where you can actually just genuinely walk in a beautiful garden with bird song and, you know, kind of a babbling brook that comes from outside and through the office. You know, I think there'll be a, I mean, the smart architects out there will address all of those different elements. The connection with nature, that's really something that's um, happening these days already with a little bit of a risk of greenwashing. That's something that we also have to be very aware of in the architectural yeah, sure. field. Um, how much of sustainability do you also have to think of when designing for luxury brands? If you don't want to answer that, you don't have to answer. I don't want you to lose no, no, job. No, I, can, I can, of course, answer it. And I'm I'm very pro, you know, sustainability and everything that that I and my team do. I think at the very beginning, it became a huge challenge for me because obviously I'd be coming up with these crazy radical ideas, but then the sustainability credentials weren't so great. But I'm also for still coming up with amazing blue sky concepts that get people excited about what, could be done and then we work out how to address that sustainably and maybe sometimes we have to prolong you know that that that, that project from happening purely because there aren't sustainable ways of doing it now but maybe in five years there will be um but if there's something that needs turning around quickly then of course you know sustainability is 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 the how not the what so to speak it's you know, there's sometimes the, the brands get confused between the two. Um, you know, the creativity still needs to drive the experience. It still needs to be compelling. It still, it still needs to be captivating. It still needs to be, you know, a, a world that we design that people are in awe of. And sustainably, um, in terms of the design approach, is absolutely the way to go. And you just need experts around you and 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 um, the right production team to work through that and 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 make it sustainable from beginning to end, which we always do. We always also measure 
the sustainability um kind of impact of all of our experiences and and then and so i mean i even talk about that on linkedin quite a lot about you know can pop-ups become stop-ups you know or pop-ups with purpose it's it's kind of saying look you know we're spending a year creating a really cool concept but it only exists for two weeks and then where does it go does it get binned most of the time it does so why don't we create a world that actually does tour or, you know, create a world where it ends up becoming a bar or, you know, also you're kind of, you know, plugging into certain parts of, of, of kind of the cityscape to create something that can be reskinned by different artists along the way. You know, if you create a foundation or a canvas that allows re-expression every three months, instead of you just tearing it down after two weeks, you've got something that exists almost on a permanent basis. And then that, that allows different members of the community or from the art scene to plug into that, uh, to re-express it through their Vista. And then it becomes something that again, from a placemaking perspective, adds value to that community. It's, it's the opposite of broken windows theory, which is uh, something from criminology or a theory from criminology, which basically says, you know, broken windows theory is if there are lots of broken windows in your community, then it almost stimulates the need for uh, more crime to happen, right? Because if people feel like no, no one cares about them anymore. So morale is low and they're like, oh, you know, this is just a terrible place I live. So I don't have any respect for it. But placemaking flips that on its head. It's kind of giving people a sense of pride for where they live. And if they have that sense of pride, they're more willing to actually do things that are, you know, the opposite of criminal. It's it's about kind of bringing value to their neighborhood. It's about, you know, taking care of uh, the way that their their community progresses, and then they become a part, a valuable part of that of that kind of evolution. So I think there's lots and lots of that conversation to be explored, especially for architects and and how they can plug into that. Yeah, and if that can be done also in a sustainable way, then uh, then it's a win win. Yeah. Sustainability is always a very sexy word that can mean different things. So um, I would love architects to also take it a step further. So it's not just about, you know, BREEAM or LEED certificates. It's it's really about looking from also from the, the designing perspective through the whole process um, to building to then um, disassembly and then seeing what happens with these materials afterwards. Definitely. I, I think we always, you know, I think sustainability is such a broad topic and like you say you know sometimes it's about discussing the long-term implications of what you design and if that's never going to be you know thrown away or 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 kind of just um you know kicked to the gutter then there's obviously a strong argument to say well actually it's going to be around for a while or there'll be you know second life um uh, existence for some of these things so i think all of that is 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 hugely important it is a massively complex uh, topic uh, something chorus is actually red hot on um and, and one of the reasons i think a lot of our, our our brands or the brands that we work with are really keen on working with us as well um you're working for mostly luxury brands what do you think would be the key lessons for architects to then try to take from your fields to a regular architecture key lessons to go from what the kind of experiences i create to normal regular architecture yeah i mean i think i think one low-hanging fruit really for ubiquitous architecture is to stop letting utility drive its aesthetic i get the utility is so important but when i wanted to be an architect when i was young i almost stood at it for seven years and then they told me it was a seven-year course and i was like oh no way um so I ended up doing graphic design for four years. But the the whole point here is that as an architect, you are a creative person, right? You're supposed to be a creative person. But if you see a lot of the architecture, even in London, I, I get really saddened by the fact that someone's designed that and they're, they're okay with it. You know, these are huge projects. And I feel that the architecture generally, especially in England, not the old architecture. I think the old architecture, oh my God, some of it's magnificent. But some of the new stuff is just horrific. There was a building in Chelsea um, that was erected about five years ago. And it's just completely out of character to anything there. There's, it's, 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 um, it's horrible. 
And so I wonder how architects get some of these designs across the line. I think if our architectures, uh, sorry, if architects took a more art driven approach to the aesthetic of, of their designs, I think they'd be more proud of their projects for a start, but also that would also kind of feed into the the feeling that people have living in a certain location. You know, if you've got beautiful buildings around you, you live in a, a beautiful place. It's, it's, it, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel proud again. Like, you know, placemaking is not just about art installations. Placemaking is also about beautiful architecture. You know, there, there are, there's no profession out there that is closer to art really i mean apart from musicians and this that, and the other but in terms of like if you think about it we all need buildings you know architects have a duty from my perspective to create work that provides an aesthetic quality to the environment they sit within and i feel like that's been lost over the years so you ask me for low hanging fruit i would say color is a, is a big thing i think material as well like think about the cool materials you can use think about texture think about tactility you know, not just flat walls, not just something that, you know, doesn't look like it has any sort of, you know, intricate identity or detail to it. Like think about that beautiful stone or marble or whatever it is. And I know that marble is not cheap, but, you know, let's look at the different material. It doesn't have to be marble, but just something with a grain, something with some some character. You know, character is really important in everything that we do and the way that we express ourselves um architecture is is there's no exception and you know in terms of color if you go to certain parts of london you have streets with like these multicolored houses and they become iconic right because everyone's like oh my god you got to go to that street it's incredible and so why an ar architect's not thinking about that on a on a on a grander level why are they exclusive to certain streets you know, there's no reason we can't make that more ubiquitous. Why can't we live in a, an environment that is um, that is that is more colorful? What's what's the town that on in the Amalfi Coast? Is it like Positano or somewhere? It's um it's called Portofino, I think. And Portofino has all those beautiful kind of colorful houses, and it's right over the uh, the 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 sea, and it's iconic because of that, right? Um, and it's beautiful. And even if it's a gray day, it's still a beautiful place to be. That that That's the kind of approach I think architects should be taking. And then also think about a sculptural identity to what you design. Why do you just have to do, and I understand that there's a cost implication, but if there isn't a cost implication, and generally there is, but like if you can somehow swing, you know, a more sculptural way of designing your your buildings then there's so much value in that it doesn't need to be the whole building it could just be could you address the windows in a sculptural way could you address the doors in a sculptural way like is there sculptural architectural detail that you could integrate into your design thinking it's that kind of stuff like this you know sculptural approaches are very much scalable but it is it is a lot about money. But I think it's even if lot. you think about some of the stuff that I'm seeing on LinkedIn and you get these buildings that, quite frankly, are a little bit drab and then they're having a beautiful mural that gets painted on the side. That's also another easy way of taking something that is normally very nondescript and turning it into something that wows. You know, I think that's also, you know, can architects work with artists as part of their approach? Maybe they design something because they don't have a great deal of budget to be a canvas for an artist that they feel complements, you know, the design of, of the architecture. And they, you know, and the artist then brings it to life. So I think there's, you know, maybe there's a collaborative thing there as well for for architects to explore. Absolutely. And that's actually something that we often do um, in a couple of projects. We left empty walls for the artist design. We worked with them. We came up with the theme often through participatory processes with people that would be then using this space. And to be frank, in some cases, these were then the main pictures of the, of the building, not really our, our design. It was mostly the artist design. 
which I'm really, I'm really proud of. Being able to sort of provide spaces for them is also quite, gives quite some satisfaction Definitely. as well. Definitely. No, I fully agree. I think I just get, when we talked about architecture and I just, I get frustrated when I see buildings that are ugly. <laughs> And there are buildings, like, and that's my thing as well. Is that no one can deny the beauty of a sunset, right? That's that's the altar. That's the holy grail of design. Like you're never going to get someone sitting sitting in front of a sunset going, "This is rubbish. This this is this doesn't this is not very cool." Like you know, everyone's wowed by a beautiful sunset that has like you know gorgeous pink and and orange rays that kind of permeate the clouds above you. Like it's striking. So. You know, let let's get creative with these canvases of opportunity. We the architects have an opportunity, and I think sometimes they don't see it that way. I think they just see it as a job, and it shouldn't just be a job. Architects can be artists if they want to be, and they should try and embrace that as much as possible. I think I I completely agree with you, and um, it seems like on one hand we very often tend to look at our profession as just a job, forgetting how much of a responsibility we have here. And on the other hand, I think sometimes also very often we tend to look at it um, from a very egoistic point of view and, um, you know, do it just for the sake of designing something artsy instead of looking again how, what kind of impact it's going to have on people, how, what kind of environment experience we're creating for people. Um, but something you very often do on, on your LinkedIn, you start your posts with a question, how to wow or how to wow. So my question first is, is it how to wow or how to wow? And then how do you actually do it? Well, what, what is, what is W-O-H, right? So if you walk into a room and you find yourself in the middle of a, I don't know, like a an environment where people don't have any clothes on, you'd go, whoa right exactly <laughs> and wow would be if you walk in and you know everyone's there looking back at you going you know we love you you're amazing you'd be like join us join us <laughs> wow you, you know so exactly so in that in that sense now they're very they're very two different um reactions but you know for me it is about how to wow and i think that anything i design that's if if i'm thinking thinking about the ultimate in response um or, or the, the the ultimate measurement of success would be that wow falls out of people's mouths and this is something that i wish to you and as well as to all the architects that are listening um i think we it does not necessarily have to have much to do with the visual aspects of it of the space that is being designed it sometimes can be about wow my kids enjoy playing here so much or Wow, so many people are out on Sunday evening at this square, wondering what makes this space so special that everyone feels welcome. Or, wow, I had such a productive session in this meeting room. Whatever that is, the wow effect can really go multisensory. I think we should all sort of aim to, to get there. Thank you so much, Brand, for this conversation. It was really inspiring. My pleasure, Magdalena. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. To avoid the fear of missing out, make sure you follow 4D Brainstorm here and on the other social media platforms like Instagram and LinkedIn. If you want to share your thoughts on this topic or would like to know how exactly this fourth dimension could be implemented in your design, just simply send an email to 4dbrainstorm at gmail.com. I'm really looking forward to exploring it further with you. Last but not least, if you're interested to know more about what I do, you can also check out the website, fordbrainstorm.com, a platform for free brainstorming in all dimensions and fields. Join the brainstorm and let's discover the fourth dimension together. Till next time!